All right, so we we know that plastic deformation in metals occurs by the movement of dislocations. That's the stepwise breaking and reforming of, of bonds. <clears throat> and we in fact know that this a dislocation is a is a one-dimensional imperfection in the crystal. <clears throat> Let's take a look at ways that we can um, prevent a dislocation from moving or, or present an obstacle to a dislocation moving. And <clears throat> the first uh, well, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll go from one dimension down to zero dimensions. And so what's zero, what, what has zero dimensions to it? Well, <clears throat> something that exists, if I draw X, Y, and Z for you here, something that has zero dimensions would only exist in one point in space. <clears throat> one point. So sometimes we actually call these things point defects point defects because they only have one a zero dimension uh, to them a line is, um, has one dimension right that's a linear defect so we, we want to look at some point defects so what type of a point defect could you have in uh, in, a, in a material and particularly let's focus on crystalline or, or organized or ordered solids so we have a number of atoms arranged somehow in a solid. And I'm being very general here with my atoms. I'm drawing them as little circles. We're treating them as little circles. If you want to think in three dimensions, these would be spheres. But here's a, a, a crystal of some atoms that are arranged. And what if I had, say, instead of these atoms, I had some other atom that was similar in size and properties but maybe just a little bit bigger, you know, something like that. So what would be the result? The result would be that the atoms that are kind of close to that one, I'm being general here, but the atoms in the vicinity of this atom might be pushed away. And what's this atom actually really doing right here? This atom here is taking the spot of another. It's substituting for one of these host atoms, the white atoms. So this green one is substituting for a white one. So this is called a substitutional atom. And because it's not the same as the ones around, it's called a substitutional impurity. And what it's doing is it's just a single, it's a point in space. It's not a collection of atoms. It's not like a particle. It's not a piece of sand in your coffee or something like that. It's it's a molecule of sugar dissolved in your coffee. In the case, in, the, in this solid case that we're talking about here, it's a solid atom, a single atom of some other element dissolved in this solid. So it's actually forming what we call a solid solution. So it's a solution in the same sense um, that we, we would discuss a solution, a liquid solution, but now it's uh, in the solid state of matter. Um, so you could have um, you could have an atom like that that's a little bit bigger. You could have one, of course, that's a bit smaller, and it would still it would create some the arrows. These red arrows would be reversed. Um, but you can also have a, an atom that's much much smaller. It's not like this green atom was roughly the same size as that one. But what if it's a tiny little atom that just uh, fits in, nestles into the space between some other atoms? Well, going into the space between other things, now we have a fancy uh, word for that, but so this is in the space between, okay, in the space between. So the space between um, other atoms is called an interstitial site. Interstitial. So that's an interstitial impurity. An example of an interstitial impurity would be carbon in iron. Um, an example of a substitutional impurity would be uh, perhaps uh, copper in nickel. They're both the same size. They actually have the same crystal structure. Um, so they can substitute in for one another. Um, and there you go. There's a couple of impurities, uh, point defects that, uh, that we have. When we have a solid solution in in a metal, 
I'm going to call this um, in a metal. We have another name that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, in a metal, what do we do? We call that an alloy. It forms an alloy. And we're mixing two elements together. It forms an alloy. All right. Uh, so that's, uh, that's fantastic. Last thing uh, I wanted to look at then is how can we use that, the presence of some kind of impurity, to make it more difficult for a dislocation to move. So let me draw a dislocation here. I'll speed up time for you here. Okay, look at that. So through the miracles of science, I created a dislocation and really quickly I saved you the agony of watching me draw circles. And we know that to get this dislocation to move, you know, through the application of a shear stress, we've got to have this bond, a row of bonds, break and then reform. And it's going to move. So we want to present some kind of an obstacle to that. Well, oftentimes, what can happen is <clears throat> these little impurity atoms can cluster themselves around the, um, the dislocation line. And they do that because that actually creates a lower energy um, it's an it's a easier place for them to exist. So I'd like you to consider, say, this scenario of the impurity atom existing at the bottom of the dislocation versus another scenario, which would be, um, let me draw it for you. So what if we had this scenario where we've got an edge dislocation <coughs> existing separately from, sorry, this thing became detached here somehow, separate in the same material, but separately existing, you know, far away from it was another, it was this interstitial. So you have to remember that this interstitial is disturbing these atoms, and there's some strain in the lattice. And then this dislocation here is as well creating some strain. There's tension below the dislocation line. There's some compression up here. So we can have the two exist separately, or through random movement, just random diffusion, this interstitial could move over and exist here in at the dislocation line. <clears throat> so which one of those is at a higher energy? Well, where they exist separately is actually a higher energy. There's more lattice strain total when they exist separately. Uh, an analogy that, um, sort of a mechanical analogy that you could think about, I suppose, is say you've got a bookshelf, and maybe you've done this, and you've got on your bookshelf, you've got um, a set of books. <laughs> uh, okay, there's some books, make that, there you go. And you know you know the scenario, there you go, you just got this much space here to fill in another book, and you've got a position what do you need to do? You need to position this big, thick book in there. Okay, I'm going to make it yellow. There's your new book, and you want to put that into the bookshelf. So what do you do? We've got two options. The first thing you could do is you could squeeze the book in to that, um, to that spot right there. So you can take this, this book right here and squeeze it in. But, I mean, you know, you get a sense for the fact that's not really going to go. That's what's going to happen is you have to squeeze it in. It's going to deform a bit. You squeeze your book in. It's hard to do. And you get that book in there. That's one option. The other option that you've got, option two, is, is this. Well, you realize that you have some space over the books. Now, really, I should have... I should have done this more carefully and actually drawn the space above the books in all the cases. So let's just quickly fix that, all right? <clears throat> I didn't think ahead, see? I didn't think ahead. Bad, bad prof. So there you go. Okay, look, now, now we've got that space there over the top of the books. In this case here, scenario one, we squeeze the book into that spot. So in the, yeah, scenario two, what we're going to do is we're going to just... Just pop the book in that space over the top. How many times have you done that? You've probably done that before if you have a bookshelf. And, you know, it just fits in easy. Which one has more energy overall? When you squeeze it in um, 
or you fit it into the space that already exists. So this one here is in the space already existing. All right, now I don't know if this is a perfect analogy, but the book is squeezed into the space that already existed, and this makes for a lower energy. That's what we're after. So which scenario here has the book squeezed into the space that already existed? Well, the book, the interstitial site, is squeezed into the place, the dislocation line that already existed. There's already some space in the lattice that you can put this impurity, so why not put it there? And they'll create less strain overall. <clears throat> if you have them exist separately, you have this empty space exists separate from this book that squeezed in, it's a higher energy. There's higher strain energy, lower energy when it fills a space that's already there. So when our interstitial fills the space that's already there, it creates a lower energy <clears throat> overall. And so it's harder than if we imagine this dislocation moving through the application of a shear stress for this dislocation to break away from this impurity because it's pinned in place by the, uh, by the impurity. The impurity has pinned the dislocation. It has to go to a higher energy state of them existing separately for the dislocation to move away from the impurity. So the impurity pinned the dislocation. All right, now that's not the entire story, but it's pretty good for describing a strengthening of a metal through um, a solid solution strengthening, the formation of an alloy or a solid solution.